ruling as large a territory as the Indian subcontinent with such a diversity of people and cultures was an extremely difficult task for any ruler to accomplish in the Middle Ages. From the latter half of the 16th century, they expanded their kingdom from Agra and Delhi until in the 17th century, they controlled nearly all of the subcontinent. They imposed structures of administration and ideas of governance that outlasted their rule, leaving a political legacy that succeeding rulers of the subcontinent could not ignore. Today, the Prime Minister of India addresses the nation on Independence Day from the ramparts of the Red Fort in Delhi, the residence of the Mughal emperors. The Mughals were descendants of two great lineages of rulers. From their mother's side, they were descendants of Chagas Khan, the Mongol ruler who ruled over parts of China and Central Asia. From the father's side, they were the successors of Timur, died 1404, the ruler of Iran, Iraq and modern-day Turkey. However, the Mughals did not like to be called Mughal or Mongol. This was because Genghis Khan's memory was associated with the massacre of innumerable people. It was also linked with the Uzbeks, their Mongol competitors. On the other hand, the Mughals were proud of their Timurid ancestry, not least of all because their great ancestor had captured Delhi in 1398. Babur, the first Mughal emperor, succeeded to the throne of Fergana in 1494 when he was only 12 years old. He was forced to leave his ancestral throne due to the invasion of another Mongol crop, the Uzbeks. After years of wandering, he seized Kabul in 1504. In 1526, he defeated the Sultan of Delhi, Ibrahim Lodi, at Panipat and captured Delhi and Agra. The administrative and military efficiency of Mughal Empire led to great economic and commercial prosperity. International travelers described it as the fabled land of wealth. But these same visitors were also appalled at the state of poverty that existed side by side with the greatest opulence. The inequalities were glaring. Documents from the 20th year of Shah Jahan's reign inform us that the highest ranking Mansabdars were only 445 in number out of a total of 8,000. The small number, a mere 5.6% of the total number of Mansabdars, received 61.5% of the total estimated revenue of the empire as salaries for themselves and their troopers. The Mughal emperors and their mensabdars spent a great deal of their income on salaries and goods. This expenditure benefited the artisans and peasantry who supplied them with goods and produce. But the scale of revenue collection left very little for investment in the hands of the primary producers, the peasant and the artisan. The poorest amongst them lived from hand to mouth and they could hardly consider investing in additional resources tools and supplies to increase productivity. The wealthier peasantry and artisanal groups, the merchants and bankers profited in this economic world. The enormous wealth and resources commanded by the Mughal elite made them an extremely powerful group of people in the late 17th century. As the authority of the Mughal emperor slowly declined, his servants emerged as powerful centers of power in the regions. They constituted new dynasties and held command of provinces like Hyderabad and Awadh. Although they continued to recognize the Mughal emperor in Delhi as their master, by the 18th century the provinces of the empire had consolidated their independent political identities. The Mughal empire began to decline in the 18th century during the reign of Muhammad Shah. Much of its territory fell under the control of the Marathas and then the British. The last Mughal emperor, Bahadur Shah II, was exiled by the British after his involvement with the Indian mutiny of 1857.